All right, this morning, as I've already told you, we're going to be looking at two more verses. And as I've said, sometimes we, we look at whole chapters and sometimes we just look at a couple of verses because of the idea that, that's there and how much time it might take to explain or develop it and to apply it. So two verses, we're going to look at uh, verses 5 and 6. I think I might back up and begin reading verse 1. If, if we're not ready to do that on the screen, that's fine. We'll just pick it up at verse 5. But going back to verse 1, Jesus, he said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to him, or said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Well, may the Lord bless his word to, um, to strengthen us in, in the truth this morning. Well, I've already told you, and we've just read, that Jesus had already warned his disciples about stumbling blocks. He warned them that they should be on their guard against several things related to that. First, against those who would stumble them. And of course, in their case, that was the Pharisees, who were encouraging them either through their teaching, which was bad teaching, false teaching. There's lots of false teaching in the world today, or through their example to do things that were wrong, things that were sinful. So he warned them about that. He warned them against their stumbling each other because even as believers we can, uh, we can do this by uh, believing things or by doing things that in some way undermine God's truth or that might uh, encourage our brothers and sisters to sort of downplay the importance or taking the Word of God seriously, not, not living with the kind of zeal the Lord would have us to have. And that kind of example can actually affect, affect us. We need to be careful. We need to be careful that, um, that we encourage one another to love the Lord and, and to serve Him. But He warned those who would stumble others um, because of the severity of punishment they would have to face for so doing. I just read he said it would be better for them to be drowned in the sea with a heavy rock, a millstone tied around their neck because of how much worse their punishment would be in hell for stumbling, Jesus said, even, uh, the, even any of the little ones who believe in him. And he wasn't referring there necessarily to children unless those children believed, but he was referring to any who actually believe in him. Now, we do need to understand, I'll remind you again, Jesus was not saying that we, as his children, as his disciples, if we happen to stumble one another, that we're going to be punished in hell. That's not what he was saying. But what he was saying is that Pharisees would, and all the false teachers would, and every unbeliever who would do this to his children, who lay in front of them some kind of impediment that keeps them from coming, either coming to him or living in the way that they should live. There's a lot of people in the world who are going to be held accountable for false teaching. But we also need to understand, on the other hand, that, that our Lord is telling us that he wants our influence towards each other to be wholesome, to, to help one another rather than harm one another. And of course, our Lord will help us to do that because he is gracious. He is a gracious Heavenly Father who will guide us in the right direction. Now, he went on to tell us how we are to deal with a brother or a sister who might stumble us uh, to do that very difficult thing of rebuking them. Remember, rebuke means to point out the wrong that they've done. It means to warn them about the consequences of that wrong. It means to urge them to turn away from that wrong. And then Jesus says that if, if it's effective, if, if they repent, if the Lord graciously works in their hearts to make them sorry for their sins so that they turn away from those sins, uh, 
and they begin doing what it is they should have been doing in the first place, and if they come to us and ask for forgiveness, he says we are to forgive them. Now, that becomes even more difficult because he says if they should do this seven times a day and come back seven times asking for forgiveness, we are to forgive them. Now, let's not forget what um, Jesus told us. We saw this last week, what his heavenly Father will do to us. If we're not willing to forgive, if we can't find it in our heart to grant forgiveness to somebody who's standing in front of us, a brother or a sister who is actually asking for forgiveness, because remember, our obligation goes even beyond that. If we can't do that, Jesus tells us that our heavenly Father will not forgive us. Remember what he says in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. I'm just reminding us of this because it's a, it is a warning that we all need to take to heart and something I think that, you know, if, that we all struggle with, forgiveness. But he says this, if, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, how do we make sense of this? Jesus is not saying that we earn forgiveness by granting forgiveness. That would turn us into a work that we do to be saved. But what he is saying is that if I've forgiven you, you will find it within your heart to forgive others. We might put it this way. A forgiven heart is a forgiving heart. And even if they don't repent, as I've said, this is the extra that we have to be willing to do. Even if they don't repent... We still need to love them enough to want to see them repent. Remember Jesus' prayer on the cross that his father would forgive those who had crucified him. They hadn't even repented. They weren't even moving towards repentance. But Jesus prayed for them anyway. The point is we're not to harbor bitterness but to desire repentance. But now this is easier said than done, isn't it? As the disciples were listening to Jesus, they were likely wondering how it was that they were going to be able to do what Jesus just told them to do. We might have thought the same thing when we heard it last week and as we heard it again this morning. Well, Jesus tells us that if we are trusting him, that we can do this. This morning, I want us to <clears throat> consider two things from this passage First of all, the, the concern on the part of the disciples. And secondly, Jesus' response to them. First of all, let's consider the disciples' concern. Now, the disciples were doing what they should be doing. They were listening to what Jesus told them, and they knew that whatever he said, they had to take seriously. They knew this was not just pious advice, right? That Jesus was saying, I think you guys should think about this, and if you think it's okay, if you think it's right, then you should do it. Well, no, that's not what Jesus was doing. Sometimes I think, I've even heard, as a matter of fact, professors at the college that I went to, not the seminary, but the college I went to say essentially the same thing. These are things we should do, but they aren't necessarily things we have to do. That basically this is an option. We can take it or leave it. Now, we do have to admit that that is one of the potential problems, if we can use those terms, of believing that we are justified by grace through faith alone. I mean, don't you, I mean that, that can be used as an excuse not to take Jesus seriously. Because once we have the prize, once we have salvation, once we know our souls are secure, it tends to make it more difficult for us to put out the effort that Jesus tells us that we need to put out to become more like him, to do his work and his will, to be sanctified. Now, on the one hand, it is true that Jesus has done everything that we need in order to be justified, in order to be saved. And there is absolutely nothing we can do to add to his work. But we also understand, if we understand the Bible correctly, that that doesn't mean that we don't take him seriously in everything else that he calls us to do. The evidence that we have received Jesus savingly, that we have been justified, is that we love him enough to do what he commands, right? If we, don't, if, we, if we think this is optional, that simply tells us we've never really come to know Jesus because we know 
that would not be the case. The Spirit of God will move us and make sure that we go the right direction, even if we do a fair amount of resisting, which, of course, we should not do. Now, Jesus just gave us a command. If a brother or sister sins, we need to rebuke them in love, in gentleness, right? We don't come down with them in fire and brimstone. But again, we, we point out their fault. We, we seek to bring them to repentance. And if they repent, we do need to forgive them. And if they sin against us several times repeatedly in a day and they keep coming to us repenting and asking forgiveness, we need to forgive them. Now, we know that it can be hard to forgive someone. Even if they sin against us once, even with God's grace, I mean, look at the church today, look at its, how it fragments, look at all the ill will, sadly, that is in the church. If that's true just from one offense, how well are we going to hold up if we have to do this several times in a day? Well, I think we know the answer to that question, and I think the disciples knew the answer to that question. They're not going to hold up very well, which is why the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. We need more help. We need, we need greater faith to receive that help because, as I've already said, faith is the way that we receive the Lord's help. That's how we look to Him. That's how we get anything from the Lord, as we saw earlier uh, in, in the reading of um, basically our, our scripture reading earlier. Whatever you ask, believing, you will receive. There has to be faith. And that's why they wanted a stronger faith. Now, let's, let's take just a moment to examine in the Scripture the different aspects of faith and the different kinds of faith to understand really what it is they needed from the Lord. The Bible mentions at least four senses in which we can use the word faith, and this will kind of help us to analyze our own situation to see whether or not we have what we need to receive from the Lord. The word faith can, first of all, be used as a noun, which means that which is to be believed. And it's used in that sense of the gospel. Jude writes this in Jude, um, it was only one chapter, but chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. And that is the gospel, right? The message that we are saved by God's grace through faith alone. Now, the other uses of the word faith, it, it's used as a verb. It, it's an action that we do, and that's what we're talking about here. It can refer, first of all, to believing the truth. Those of you who are in the new members class, we just recently went through this. Some of this would be review, okay? James writes this in James 2.19, speaking to his opponents. You believe that God is one, okay? You have a right, a right belief, Right? He says, you do well, the demons also believe and shudder. Now, this is a kind of faith. This is a faith where I, I assent or I believe that what God tells me in his word is true. Now, let me, let me just say this because this is something I think we realize, but something if we don't, we need to become aware of. But most people today who believe themselves to be Christians really have nothing other than this kind of faith. And we call this, again, historic faith. They believe the gospel is true. Okay? They believe the Bible. They believe Jesus was born of the Virgin. They believe that he lived and died on the cross, that he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. But the thing is, you can believe that and not be saved. The demons believe that, don't they? They believe those things are true. The devil believes that. But they're not saved by it. Okay? The kind of faith that that we need is a kind of faith that transforms our lives. But you can believe the gospel is true and still not be transformed by it. Now, faith can also refer to trust, looking to Jesus and receiving from him his righteousness. Okay, our righteousness just won't do. We're, we're just not good enough. We come into this world already guilty of Adam's sin. We do nothing but sin since we come into the world. And even with God's grace, sadly, the things we do are still imperfect. We will never be good enough, but we need a perfect righteousness. We receive that by trusting in the Lord Jesus. When we trust in Jesus, our sins are also removed. 
Now, Jesus died for those sins on the cross. They were laid upon him, but we do not receive that forgiveness until we trust in him. And when we do, all of our sins are taken away, past, present, and future, even though he still wants us to confess these sins. So at that moment, we trust in Jesus. We have justifying, we have justifying faith, right? We are justified by him. We call, that's why we call it justifying faith. And we are acceptable by God. We are accepted by him into his family. By the way, when Paul and Silas answered the Philippian jailer's question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. This is the kind of faith they were talking about, the kind that trusts in Jesus for everything that, that they need to enter into heaven. This is the kind of faith the Spirit of God gives. As I've said, a person doesn't have to be saved to believe the Bible is true. They don't have to have a faith given by the Holy Spirit, but to trust Jesus, you do. This kind of faith transforms the life. It turns us away from our sins. It moves us to put the Lord and His kingdom first in our lives and moves us to live by His word. Listen to what John the Baptist says in John 3.36. He says this, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. What kind of belief are you talking about here, John? Are you talking about just believing the facts? No, because of what he says next. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And what he's saying is that if you have a belief that saves, you have a belief that transforms, that gives you the desire to do the will of God. So if you don't have that desire... You don't have saving faith. How do you know whether you have that desire? Well, because you're doing what the Lord calls you to do. It's very easy actually to see. Not perfectly, but really we take seriously what he says. But there is one more kind of faith in, in the scripture. We call it the faith of miracles, the ability to do or to receive uh, miracles or anything that actually the Lord has for us. You know, as we read through the scriptures, we see that our Lord Jesus typically didn't heal unless the person he ministered to had faith. Now, there are exceptions. When he raised the dead, the dead person didn't have faith. Jesus did that without that person having faith. But usually that person had faith, the faith to receive a miracle from the Lord. He said to the woman who was healed from her hemorrhaging in Mark 5, 34, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You know, in that case, Jesus didn't even see her, right? He, he knew that something had happened because she, she basically believed so strongly that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. And she did touch it, and she was healed. Now, this is the kind of faith that James tells us that we need to have to receive from the Lord, okay? Faith that believes that he has the ability and will give it to us because he's made this promise. James writes in James 1, verses 5 through 8, and what he says here of wisdom applies to, to anything he promises. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But... He must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, that is what I've said. A faith that believes the Lord enough to receive uh, a miracle or, or a promise. You know, the interesting thing is that one can even have this kind of faith and still not be saved. And how do we know that? Well, because um, we have a clear example in Scripture of somebody who actually had faith to do miracles, and he clearly wasn't saved, and that was Judas. Again, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it, that Judas, this one that Jesus said was a devil, uh, one who he said it would be better if this man had never been born. He was counted among the twelve, sent out with the twelve, endued with the power to heal the sick and to raise the dead and to cleanse the lepers. And do you know that Judas actually even preached the gospel 
And yet, he clearly was not saved. And Paul implies that there are others that could feasibly do this from what he says in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 2. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, in other words, if I have that gift of languages, but do not have love, that is the love of the Holy Spirit, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal in the ears of the Lord. What I say, what I do is not pleasing to Him. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, the faith of miracles, but do not have love, I am nothing. Well, you see, everyone who is saved has that love of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. So he's talking about situations where somebody might have these great gifts, but do not, do not have this love. I, I think Paul perhaps wouldn't have used that illustration if it wasn't possible. So the point is, we can have an historic faith, we can believe the facts of the gospel, we can even have the faith of miracles, to do miracles, at least when miracles could be done, or even to receive things. Do you think the Lord never answers the prayer of an unbelieving person, a person who's not saved? There are people who look to Him in times of difficulty, and the Lord sometimes graciously bails them out. But that doesn't mean that they're saved because you can have these kinds of faith and still not, not be saved. And we need to make sure that we don't confuse these things. Sometimes people base, again, their salvation on the fact they believe the Bible. Sometimes they base their salvation on the fact that I prayed to the Lord and He heard me and answered my prayer. I must be saved. I must be a Christian. But that's not necessarily the case. The only way we can know that we're saved is if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus and placing our whole hope of heaven on Him and that that faith is transforming our lives. We have the love of the Holy Spirit moving us in the direction God calls us to go. So that is possible to have those and not be saved, but it's also true that if we are trusting in Jesus to save us, we will have historic faith and we will have this faith of miracles. The apostles believed when they trusted in the Lord. They, they were justified. They couldn't have done this unless they believed in the gospel. But we know they also had the faith of miracles, didn't they? They'd already been sent out by Jesus again to do the things I told you Judas had already done, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and preaching the gospel. Now, getting back to what we're talking about here more specifically, this means that they already had what they needed to receive his help to forgive others. They really did not need more faith, what they were asking Jesus for. Now, we might often think that we don't have enough, right, to do what Jesus calls us to do. But that also isn't necessarily the case. So that was the, the, the disciples' reaction. Second, we see Jesus' response to their request. And this is his response in Luke 17, 6. And I do think his response is somewhat veiled by this particular translation. He says, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, we often read this as though Jesus was saying, if you had even a very small amount of faith, you would be able to do the impossible you could command this tree to uproot and plant itself in the sea and it would obey you, but you can't do that because you don't have even that much faith. Well, you know, that is what Jesus meant in some other examples we have in Scripture when his disciples asked, for instance, why were we not able to cast out a demon? Jesus said to them in Matthew 17, 20, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But that's not what he's saying here, and you wouldn't actually see that unless you could read the original. But what he's saying here is this. If you had faith like a mustard seed, by the way, you do have that faith. You could have commanded this mulberry tree to be uprooted and planted in, in the sea, and it would have obeyed you. In other words, you already had 
the ability to do this. You don't need more faith, Jesus is saying. In this particular instance, you simply need to use the faith that you have. Now, Jesus, as we know, uses the image of the mustard seed to teach us, I think, a valuable lesson. It is a very small seed, the smallest of the garden plants, but when it is planted and grows, it becomes a, a, a great tree, right? The birds of the air nest in its branches, and he was using that as an illustration of his kingdom. But the illustration also applies to faith. If you have small faith, it can grow to larger faith. He was teaching them that their small faith, though it was already powerful, has the potential to become much more powerful than it is. Now, it's been said that faith is like an empty hand that reaches out to God in order that he might fill it. If that's true, then even a weak faith can actually do powerful things. Isn't that what Jesus is telling us? Even the size of a mustard seed, right? But the reason why it can do powerful things is not because faith has power in and of itself, but it's because it reaches out to a powerful God. Let me read you a quote from George Downham. He's one of the, old, the, uh, the Puritans, and, and we respect the Puritans in this church. They had a great deal of, of wisdom um, and insight into the Word of God. He writes this about justifying faith, that it doesn't take a strong faith in order to be justified. It just takes even the weakest faith. You know, it has what it needs. But I, wanna, I want us to, as I read this, to think about how it applies to everything we ask from the Lord. You don't need a strong faith, even a weak faith will do. But this is what he says. We must understand that faith does not justify and save us by itself, but as an instrument whereby we laid hold of and apply to ourselves Christ with his righteousness and merits by which only we appear before God. You know, sometimes the Puritans are hard to understand. I hope that wasn't hard to understand, but faith doesn't save us. Faith in Jesus saves us, and it's Jesus who actually saves us. Faith is just the way we receive what Jesus has to give us. We might say faith is not a work that we do in order to receive what Jesus has for us, but faith is looking away from ourselves and our works to Jesus alone to save us. Okay, that's what faith does. Now he goes on to say this. A small and weak hand, if it be able to reach up the meat to the mouth, as well performs its duty for the nourishment of the body as one of great strength, because it is not the strength of the hand, but the goodness of the meat which nourishes the body. I think you can see how that applies to Jesus. It's not the strength of my faith that saves me, but it's the nourishment that Jesus has to give me. It's the meat, the manna from heaven that, that gives life to the world. I'm able to reach out and receive that. But you see, the same thing applies to whatever else the Lord promises us in his word as well. If we have enough faith to ask for his help, we can receive the power that we need to obey him. Now, let's, let's be clear here. Jesus is not telling us that we don't need a stronger faith. I think we understand a stronger faith is going to help us in absolutely everything we do. But what he's saying here is that if we have a justifying faith, if we're trusting in Jesus, if we're saved, we already have what we need to get the help from him to do everything that he commands us to do. He's telling the disciples here they have the ability to already receive that help. They don't actually need a stronger faith. They just simply need to use the faith they have. So the application to us is essentially the same. If we lack the strength to forgive others, if we lack the patience to bear with their weaknesses as they continue to grow because they keep offending us and they have to keep coming back to us asking for forgiveness, if we need the help to overcome our own faults, so that we don't stumble our brothers and sisters, so that we might grow more into the image of Jesus. If we lack the courage to live openly as Christians in this world and to share his gospel with the lost, what we need isn't so much a greater faith as simply looking to him in faith with the faith he's already given to us to receive his help. The more we do this, the more we'll see him at work. You know, the Lord tells us we, we have not because we ask not. 
That's what James tells us, right? And sometimes we ask and don't receive because we ask with the wrong motives. But if, if we ask with the right motives, we will receive. And the more that we ask, the more we're going to see him giving. And as, he, as we see more answers to prayer, the stronger our faith is going to grow until it becomes, you know, well, the, what, are the, what are the limits? Nothing. Nothing will be impossible, Jesus says, with a strong faith. So as we grow in faith, our, our, our ability to get help will increase as well as uh, our growth into the likeness of our Savior, which is the ultimate end for which the Lord actually saved us. So let's remember to use our faith and to stop doubting, to trust the Lord because He's faithful and He will give us what He has promised to give us if we will simply ask in faith. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us.